testing, testing. I don't know how we want to start out like every cut and paste intro. Yeah, we're probably going to have to figure that out. We need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode two. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. I think Cassie and I have said this several times that we thought that the Kennedys were trash. Like, just horrible Just people. horrible people and, like, the whole Marilyn thing and... Yeah, just, like, I don't know. It just sounded like it, they were all gaudy and flashy and rich greedy. and selfish and, yeah, mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff. But when you really dig into who their family was, like, as a family unit and then as individuals... I feel like they did more good than harm. Yeah. And it makes me sad that their reputation is so tainted by mm-hmm. their as- the assassinations and the Kennedy curse and the affairs and all of that drama overshadows all of the amazing stuff that they get- they did. And it's really not super fair because you look at like MLK and he had affairs oh gosh, and he wasn't the greatest yeah, husband true. and no one thinks about that when they think of MLK. No. Everyone thinks of all of the amazing things that he did as they should. Right. Exactly. And we should just look at, yeah, the amazing things that people have done for other human beings and just know deep down inside they're human and they've done evil. Absolutely. And my mind has been blown so many times while researching and writing these scripts. So we will get more of a big picture and we'll just kind of unfold more and more of who the Kennedys were and who Jack was and who each sibling turned out to be. But the family legacy to me is very, very different than the perception that I came into this with. I really want to look at these older kids' relationships with each other because we are about to hear in upcoming episodes some huge decisions that they each make. And in order to understand the depth of those decisions, I want to have a basis of who these people were. You need to understand what they were like as brothers and sisters and how they carried that responsibility. There's something so unique about a huge group of siblings, but specifically with this type of parenting style, because since they were so encouraged to be different and unique, they really kind of fragmented what kind of relationship they could have with each of their siblings. This is what's so weird to me about the Disney brother relationship, how there were four of them, four of the, four of the Disney siblings. Yeah. No, five. Yes. Four boys. Sorry. Yeah. I always freaking do that. Four boys and and then then a little sister. Yes. But they didn't all five have these unique relationships. Whereas the Kennedys, they all are connected in different ways and they all fulfill different needs for each other. And you will see later that is very, very, very highly encouraged and drilled into their heads by their father. And their mom. You're going to be best friends. Yes. Yeah. And our mom did that with us, and I feel like that's a lot of the reason we're so close now. Yeah, because we feel All responsible for each other. Yeah. But anyways, with the Disneys, yeah, they just like almost cut off their other siblings, and it was just them two against the world. So they filled that mentor relationship, that competitive yeah, relationship, right. that pushing each other to do better, but also the soulmate, the emotional, the vulnerable. Like they were each other's everything. They were best friends. They were playmates. They worked together. It was every facet of a relationship. But with the Kennedys, they had all of that within their siblings, but just different parts for each different person. So we'll just see more and more of this roll out. And it even changes throughout different phases and chapters of life. But it's just really cool. And I feel like it would be so fun to be a part of this huge group of people that all have your back and that you can kind of just bounce between day to day. You know what I mean? Yeah. We do that just within our our three, us three sisters. Me and Bethany have definitely a more business relationship. We are much more harsh with each other. Nobody in the world can make each other more mad than (laughs) we can. Um, But, like, we also probably understand each other in the deepest way, like our motivations and the future. Yeah, like our plans, what we want to do in life. But then Bethany and Audrey have a super tender relationship. And Bethany's always had, like, this number one special spot for Audrey in her heart. She's her protector. But then me and Audrey have the most similar minds to each other. And we can kind of understand each other other's on a level on an emotional level that yeah that nobody else gets so it's just it, it is similar but like with so many more siblings it's like magnified yeah and it's 
it's interesting that they, because you would think that, oh, the two closest in age would be best friends or Mm -hmm. the two youngest would get into trouble together the most, but they didn't really separate themselves based on that. I mean, a little bit like the youngest few and then the oldest few, but you'll see coming up, even like Jack and Bobby, which Bobby was how many years younger than Jack? A lot. Like there was a 13. Yeah. There was a huge gap there. And Jack was already off at school before Bobby was even like running around as a kid because he went to boarding school. So it's so interesting to me that they were still so close, even though there were huge age gaps in between them, as well as gender differences. They all had different interests and careers, but they still all were so close, even though they didn't even spend most of their childhood together necessarily because they were all all off at different boarding schools, different universities, and at some points in different countries. I've heard a lot of like way older siblings who live in a different house and know, okay, my younger brother's in like second grade or whatever, but they don't really know what's going on in their day-to-day life. And Joe Jr. seems like he was involved in exactly what was going on with his younger siblings and may even making decisions, giving them encouragement with their things that were happening in their life. They talk about him like he was a second dad, not an uncle. Exactly. And there is less of that distance there mm-hmm. and more of that responsibility of like, you're my kid. And it seems like Joe took on that. You're my kid. I'm responsible for you. And I want to have a, a huge hand in who you become. Mm-hmm. Joe Jr. was not just like a oh, my big brother's a punk. I want to be him when I grow up. Joe Jr. was the ultimate leader and they wanted to be him because he had, he took on such responsibility and was such a serious person and was so present. Jack and Joe Jr.'s relationship is really proving to me that the whole like younger siblings look up to their older siblings thing is real. She's so rude. If you guys don't know, (laughs) Bethany is the middle child. So I would be the person that she was looking up to. I'm the big sister. And I look up to you, but I look up to you in the same way that I like look up to Audrey or look up to anyone that I love and respect. It's not like you're put on this massive pedestal. But I guess maybe because the parents, Joe and Rose, maybe painted this like character, like um, caricature larger than life persona of Joe of like, he's the freaking football star. He's going to be president. He's amazing. Yeah, for sure. And they created that dynamic for their children and had the older siblings taking on a lot more of like a caretaking role than I think most elevated. Yeah. And you'll see in a lot of the letters between Rosemary and her siblings and the parents and the other children when talking about Rosemary that they had the other kids sort of being like the in-between when the parents wanted to share thoughts with their children, but they thought, oh, maybe this would be better taken from an older sibling. They did utilize their kids as as like messengers or like- Yeah, cheerleaders and people to oversee. I think in episode, or in the beginning of episode one, I think Cassie mentioned too about how when the parents were out of town, they would ask Joe Jr. like, how is so-and-so doing? It was just like up to the oldest siblings to like keep everyone in line. But- in a lot of the research Cassie has done about Joe Jr., he seems like the ultimate, like, golden child, oldest sibling, wanted to, like, was born for that part. Yep. So I think it's even more extreme in this scenario. But where you see the, like, toxic side of it is with the Bouvier sisters and Lee looking up to Jackie, but also, yeah. like, hating her because she was on such a pedestal and because her parents did treat her differently because she was the oldest So obviously not everything is due to birth order or natural personality or environment. It's like a massive mix of all of those things combined and parenting styles and events, traumatic events that have happened. Everything just shapes who we become. But it is interesting to look at how much Jack wants to sort of be like Joe, but also is angry about being the youngest and is sort of like Lee Bouvier in that way. So yes, I just he's always getting overshadowed and does not like getting overshadowed, does not like being, oh, you're the little mini me. He wants to be the center of attention and the star and he wants to be looked up to as well. But he's like, but my big brother is really the star. He hung the moon. He's the person that I want to be like. Yeah. I want to wake up in the morning and I want to be like Joe Jr. And Joe Sr. thought that as well. Or people have speculated that Jack was who Joe was 
as a person. They were more alike, but Joe Sr. wanted to be like. Joe Jr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think that our parents didn't really, like our parents definitely gave Cassie a lot more eldest sister responsibility in like how Audrey and I were disciplined and what we should be allowed to do at what age? Like, can Bethany get her ears pierced at 12? <laughs> what do you think, Cassie? But I also don't think that I ever, and maybe I'm just an, an oblivious person, but I never felt like the shunned middle child. So maybe that yeah, helped our release family, some of the competition between Cassie and I. I, our, I never was like, screw Cassie the oldest. She's perfect. Because our family didn't really highlight the oldest or the youngest role. It was just like, okay, we're three people. And Joe Jr. definitely had the crown of being the oldest. He had he w was the heir to the throne. We didn't have a throne. <laughs> no, we didn't have no birthright. <laughs> That's something that I think is so freaking interesting is that Jackie married her father, but also she married her sister. Mm -hmm. They were very similar, Jack and Lee. It's super weird. If you haven't listened to those episodes, you have to because – the similarities and the correlations and just how her story ties in with the Kennedys. Obviously, JFK goes on to marry her and she has his babies. But the correlation between who JFK was and who Lee is, we go into a lot more of Lee's personality. And if you can just take that and kind of attach it to JFK in a way, that will help you kind of see the the position that he was in. But then he he made a very different decision and reacted very or responded very differently to those feelings. All of this just made Jack so much more competitive and mm -hmm. made him more confident and more determined to be successful. Whereas Lee, it just made her either as a kid, like disassociate and go into this fantasy world of poor me, I'm so lonely. And then as an adult, more of just live this not victim life, but like this. Yeah. She was in this loop this cycle of depression. And because of that depression, she couldn't even enjoy her sibling relationship like she would have been able to. Or if, her life. Or her life. Yeah, honestly. Her, like her marriages, her as a mom, like all of these things just ended up in her feeling sorry for herself. And whether that's a personality thing or because they were the two oldest boys out of nine and being there being a little bit more of a buffer with other siblings involved. A little more perspective. Whereas with Lee, it was like, you just don't measure up as the only other daughter that we have. And the other daughter that we have is... There's one success and one failure. Yes. Whether that or choices or gender as well. I don't know if boys are just like naturally more competitive and can like fight it out physically. Yeah. I mean, I think that male personalities are definitely going to be less likely to just buckle into the victim mentality. Not to say that would be across the board, but just women are going to be more often passive. Lee felt like maybe she had to do that against Jackie, but because the boys are able to like physically fight fight it out and girls kind of have to or had to behave behave and aren't allowed to brawl <laughs> especially back that, then like they couldn't ever yeah, get it out. It was just constantly like shove it down, push it down. And she had to, like, Lee had to hold on to these feelings for years and decades and decades. And well, she just, didn't have to. No. But it makes it harder to move on when you can't express yourself and feel like you've been heard. I am that way. That is my personality. And Bethany and I will, quote unquote, like, go brawl. head to head. <laughs> yeah. And with um, an argument. If you don't confront it and talk about it, it makes it a lot harder to. Yeah. And manage. Lee, Lee and Jackie never really got to go head to head with anything. Oh, so yes. It's like that never... was actually one of the hallmarks of their story is even in the end, they knew they had stuff to talk about and they knew they had issues, but they never got a chance to, yeah. to really discuss it. They never addressed it ever. Yeah. Even when Jackie was literally on her deathbed, they just kind of let bygones be bygones. And I think that that did hurt their relationship. Um, but I don't know if that was just the culture or yeah, like we said, gender it could have been a lot of different things, but it is. It could have been just the parenting that they received. Yeah, I mean, the it could have family been family dynamic of we just hush hush. That's exactly what was. Janet said. Janet said that's what our family does. Our family business is secrets, and the Kennedys <laughs> were a lot more loud. 
in the fact that there were nine of them, there were so many different personalities and you had to get used to people and you had to argue and you had to be more, more confrontational, I think, with just two. It was, yeah, it's kind of like the Kardashians. Like they just address things and they keep it moving. Their family dynamic sounds pretty similar to the Kardashian family dynamic. There's a lot of different characters. Everyone's successful in their own way and they have that individualist mentality, but also as a collective, they enjoy being in each other's presence. They're all super busy with their own things, but they still make time for family on a weekly basis. And that seems like it's the biggest priority in their life is to maintain that family. And they're all cogs in a big machine. Yeah. They're each other's best friends. They're also each other's enemies, but they're not afraid to fight it out. You Mm -hmm. hear a lot in the first couple episodes of Joe and Jack fighting it out and kind of butting heads a ton, but they never like walk away from it or think this is too much effort. I don't want to fight anymore. They also never let it get to them so bad that they hate each other. It's just they're comfortable with that push and pull. Yeah. They also are all like super good at forgiving and have all done like fairly bad things, the Kennedy children and the Kardashian kids. It's like that health in chaos. Like everything is always going to be chaotic. Okay. Let's learn how to function and live and have fun and be best friends still in that without getting so offended and so hurt that like we can't come back. Yes. And it's exactly what Cassie said in the Kardashian episodes in season one. She said that they had to realize at an early age, the Kardashian kids had to realize that peace and comfort wasn't ever going to be the goal. Like it can't be the goal because it's not maintainable. We're not going to be able to have the life that we want if peace is the goal. We're always going to be like, oh, we're we're failing. We're not reaching what we want to be at. Yes, because there were so many different characters and with Chris as their mom, the divorces and the deaths and the marriages and all of that kind of stuff. It was just like peace isn't the goal here. What we need in order to have the best life and the life that we want is grace, forgiveness. We need to be resilient because being able to be flexible is going to give us peace, the best life. And yes, in a way, peace. If you can't change your circumstance, change your perspective, change your mindset, mm. change your expectations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Always back to them expectations. And now to ensure that you stay well fed, here is your conspiracy of the week. One of the juiciest little details from episode two that we didn't actually dive into at all is Mr. Lemoyne Billings. Lem Billings. There are so many rumors and people who believe that maybe Jack was in a relationship with Lem. Was Lem gay? Was Jack gay? Were they the ones who were actually in love and Jackie was just Jack's beard? He's painted to be like this mysterious, like, oh my gosh, maybe he's Jack's secret lover. Like he's in all of these photos in the background. No, he wasn't. We literally know exactly who he was. (laughs) We know that he is Lem Billings. He was Jack's best friend. Um, Some people believe literally that him and Jack had a romantic relationship, but I've scoured books for the narrative and it all comes from one book that I can see. And there's no evidence of that. Historians who study Jack's life don't su- subscribe to that theory either. Just that Lim was most likely independently gay and he may have had like a one-sided romantic affection for Jack, but not a relationship. So getting the historian's perspective and then reading all of what they had to say about Jack and then the letters between Jack and Lim and really understanding the dynamic between them and then specifically Jack's personality in contrast with Lem's personality, what things were important to Jack, what he did later in life, it really seems to me that I agree with most of the historians that Lem was just independently gay and had a special affection for not only Jack, but the Kennedy family. And Jack knew about it and probably a lot of the Kennedy family knew about it and was just fine with it and loved Lem regardless of what society said but that Jack was not in a romantic relationship with him. I can't tell if Lem had a one-sided romantic affection for Jack or if they truly were just best friends and Jack was fine with keeping Lem's secrets. And so they kind of just operated like that. And Lem had a lot of um, maybe one night stands or like isolated relationships versus like a long-term, long-term partner. He didn't ever marry in his life or if Lem was really 
romantically interested in Jack and Jack was just fine with it and like didn't kind of let him on or yeah not let him on but just like well if you want to hang around me that's fine Mm -hmm. so I don't know between those two but from what I've read in their letters it doesn't really seem like there was that weirdness between them like romance intimacy right it it seems like early on they were very playful they were both very rebellious they understood each other wanting to buck authority and what society said that they needed to be like and regimentation and rules, which makes sense if you were gay. There's even a point in their letters coming up that's very, very like heterosexual and also very playful and just bros hanging out doing stupid stuff. I think that, and Bethany mentioned this, from reading so many of their intimate letters that were, you know, to and from each other, if there were romantic feelings, awkward feelings, a relationship, any kind of secret like that, I feel like we would see it because we have their one-on-one conversations. Yeah. And they didn't know that those letters were going to be published when they were writing them. They did not know Jack was going to be anybody by this point. They were in high school when they started writing these letters. And the Kennedys obviously were a prominent family in the US, but no prospects of being president. That's for sure. Yeah. So why would anyone want to go through and read all of their letters? There would at least be some sort of hint, I would think, at that type of relationship if it did exist. Isn't there also the conspiracy with Kick? Yeah. He did adore Kick. There is some small evidence that he was like romantically interested in her. Maybe it was just more of a vulnerable affection for a sister that he didn't have. Especially since if Kick's personality is a lot like Jack's. Yeah. Like, obviously he liked that personality. He, yeah, he must just have a special place in his heart for someone like that, and he loved to be around them. But outside of just Jack and Kick, he was like a brother to all of the Kennedy siblings. And remained that way his whole life because they even took him on family vacations. He, he stayed moved in around the, with them. He stayed in the White House with Jack and Jackie. And Jack and Lem study abroad together. And Mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy is obviously funding all of that. So they did really take him on as one of their own. So I don't know. There's some speculation from historians that Lem may have had affectionate romantic feelings toward Kick. But then some people say they just think it was a an affection towards like a little sister. There's also Kick trying to get in on their pranks between each other. Lem could have been romantically affectionate towards Jack and Kick. He could have been romantically affectionate for one of them, or he could have just loved having a family and loved having Mm -hmm. siblings and then also been independently gay. And then I do want to highlight the whole him not being married. I feel like this could go either way or both, that he was gay and couldn't share that openly. Or he just didn't have a family of his own and he enjoyed so much being around the Kennedys, going everywhere they were going, taking advantage of their family dynamic because legit, it's a really cool family family dynamic. And it's like why family vloggers even became a thing. Having a big, loud, fun, exciting, spontaneous family where everybody belongs and everybody's different, it's so attractive and so awesome to get to be a part of. So there are just so many dynamics. And I think you have to think about who Lim was and who the Kennedys were. Joe Sr. always encouraged independent thought and being unique and not listening to what society says. So it just makes so much sense that Jack would let Lim be whoever he wanted to be and hang around if he wanted to hang around and not hang. Like that was his choice. Whether he felt like oh, Lem is over dedicating his life to my family or not. Like he didn't have that question in his head. Lem could do whatever he wanted to Mm -hmm. and be whoever he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. If you think too about who Jack was as a person and you're going to find out a lot more and I think it's episode five about who Jack was as a young adult and the choices that he was more inclined to because of his natural born personality versus who he kind of had to become in order to have the position and the power that he wanted to have. Later on, obviously, we all know that he had a lot of affairs and was promiscuous. And if he, I don't want to spoil too much, but if he wasn't president, he may have never gotten married. And it seems like maybe he had plans to really never get married until he needed to. And if Lim was also like this, but didn't need a wife in order to become president, I feel like 
Lem lived out a alternate life of Jack's. If that makes That's sense. That's interesting. Yeah. If they have a similar personality. Because I did. feel like they were the three musketeers, Jack, or yeah, Jack, Kick, and Lem out of everyone. They were the closest, but they were also the most misfits, the most frivolous with their personal life kind of, and wild. And so- They just wanted to have fun. Yeah. They were just here for the party. And if Lem was getting everything he wanted out of life with- the Kennedy's money and status and exciting events and exciting lifestyle. He was like being fulfilled on all of the levels he wanted to be fulfilled on. And he didn't, he may have not needed a life partner in order to feel fulfilled. It made me uncomfortable at first, how much the Kennedys allowed Lem to just dedicate his life to them. But Hey, he, that's what he wanted to do. Yeah. I I feel like I would pick that life. Like I could see myself doing that. You kind of do do that. Yeah, I do do that. (laughs) And, And I'm like, Probably happier than the people who are actually living that life. For sure, yeah. He was getting to go on family vacations and go see the freaking world and be a part of a family. And then something that Lim really highlighted about the Kennedys was that whole sentiment of it seems like the Kennedys really did step up to the plate each time there was an opportunity to serve or to help. Take responsibility for, yeah, any issue. They just kind of, okay, it's right in front of us. Something that needs someone to help has been presented. Any sort of issue that came up that needed attention, they were just like, why not us? So Jack becomes friends with Lem at a young age. Then he becomes an orphan and was left with no money. They were like, "Mm, this is something we can solve. Why not add a 10th child to our family? So now I want to look at Jack and Kick's relationship specifically. And she is the fourth Kennedy sibling. So it's Joe Jr., JFK, Rosemary, and Kick. Because Rosemary wasn't really able to take on the responsibilities of the oldest sister, that kind of defaulted to Kick. And because Kick and JFK had very similar personalities and hung out a ton, Kick kind of rose to the occasion and took on that eldest daughter role. What's interesting is the female version and the male version of this middle child, younger sibling, troublemaker, rebellious independent spirit personality because Kick was just as charismatic and charming and fun loving as Jack was, but she was not at all as sexually loose and promiscuous as Jack was. Her Catholic beliefs and her relationship with with God was really important to her. And so she was a little bit of her mother of like the very pure, I'm going to go out and party and I'm going to dance and I'm going to have fun and I'm going to wear red lipstick. But where Jack was going to have fun in any way he could think of, Kick was not. I wonder, we're always comparing to the Enneagram, but I wonder if she was an Enneagram one or an Enneagram eight or something because she's like that fighter personality right. like out very there. Very independent. Very independent. Very much. Like Maybe she could have been like an eight wing seven because she like wanted to have fun and everything. Or a one with. But you can't. A wing. one in health because a one in health is a seven. Oh. Uh. Yeah. But that's why eight and ones are super similar to me because this is so nerdy and no one cares. <laughs> but, this, but they both can tap into their seven super hardcore. Oh, wow. Okay. And anyways, but I, because I'm like that, I'll break rules if I think that it's, if it doesn't matter. But if it's right. like goes to my, the core of my belief, then I'm like super hard. You, you no. like I'll you, go until the line, but I will not yes. go past the line. You don't believe in rules that you don't either see the purpose of or agree with or like fully understand. Yes. But so if, if she was do, like, oh, my parents don't really care. Like, yeah. we can, but if it's between me black and, God, and white, yeah. Yes. Okay, now remember that quote from episode two that a classmate said? Quote Kathleen was bonded to Jack with a profundity that mere blood seemed insufficient to describe. That's the kind of stuff I didn't know about the Kennedys. I just thought that they were all like accomplishment people and yes. like accolades. Very, yeah. I saw them as like not emotional. I saw them as not being close or vulnerable like that. I don't know why, but I think it's because you me. just, you assume, and I think that the media portrays this and just what, how people talk about it, but. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was like horrible or anything. I just thought like you are a biz, down to business individual person and yeah. that was not how they operated at all. Yeah, I know. I always tell Cassie that they were on 
something because how can <laughs> how you do you be, get that much energy yes how can you be 100 on like all fronts because i think that's why the media portrays it like that and like rom-coms and all of that stuff when someone is super career driven at the top like ceos not even president just the ceo of a company they their f- home life their family life suffers a right. ton and yeah like you said not out of like evil or spite or whatever it's just you can have one priority in life right and it cannot be you cannot give your 100 percent to your home and to right your job but f- somehow they found a wormhole in time and space like they did what p- other people just can't do and I think it was a mindset thing. I think that nobody mindset. ever told them that they couldn't, first of all. And then second, they had the means yes, because they didn't have to worry the second. about paying their bills. They could just worry about hanging out with their family and pushing the boundaries. And I don't know, building things that were bigger than paying a paycheck. You know what I mean? Yes. And or because earning a paycheck. And because they were all very, other than Rosemary, but- they were all individually super confident and all individually had their own thing, like career, right. academia, whatever it was going for them. It's almost like they weren't constantly second guessing, oh, do they know that I love them? Or, oh, they weren't letting negative things like get in the way of their relationships with each other or in the way of their career and success and whatever. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like all positive. And even when they go yeah. through like insane tragedies, it's like they just know we're all going to like blaze through this together as one unit. They're not wasting right. time second guessing things yes and i do think that that's huge i think a lot of it is is a mental thing and the privilege allowed it to even happen obviously but there are a lot of privileged people who have enough money to you know do whatever or focus on whatever but it's like nobody told the kennedys that they couldn't do it you know what i mean yes it's literally like the kardashian story no, who gave chris the permission to do what she did yeah she just decided like she set her eye sights on something and went for it yes and didn't wait around to see like oh is this appropriate or am i allowed to yes and do be- i have the permission the kennedys were born with permission and they you'll see later we will talk about kind of their dynamic and how they operated but they never even had the thought that they wouldn't have permission to do whatever and it started with their grandparents or right grandparents of like setting their sights on the presidency literally started with their grandparents their grandparents it took three generations to get there and but. then joe kennedy we talked last episode their dad created his wealth based on that manifestation nobody's gonna tell me i can't do it if i have the ability and the talent i can just go and get it and so i feel like that's how he raised his kids they were confident. They were super confident. That's what it boils down to. You have to think that you are capable of doing it. You can't waste half your life asking other people if you can do it. And if you walk into every room with the education and the resources to accomplish it and also the personality, like you're basically selling yourself and mm-hmm. pitching yourself to all of these other people. Yeah. You've got it. It's in the bag. Right. And they had all the freaking the work ethic. Another golden thread throughout this entire thing is that the Kennedys always seem to have this awareness of how rare their privilege was. They weren't just like a rich family. They were the Kennedys. And maybe that's how they were able to take on so much responsibility because they they had that mentality and awareness of like, not everybody gets this. I I need to use it. That's my duty i've been given this superpower Mm -hmm. and when you're conscious of your superpower you are able to be so much more impactful and you can start at such an earlier age when you realize your gift young and to them their gift was their privilege and their family they were the kennedy clan and they did have this magical aura around them as they lived life and people noticed it in them And like Uncle Ben so wisely stated in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And the Kennedys knew that. The Kennedys knew it. They lived it. They breathed it. And it was because of the dynamic that their parents set out for them and their grandparents and great-grandparents, honestly. Yeah, they like didn't think that it was easy or that everyone was like them. It's just interesting to me that they were so self-aware because – when reading these people's biographies and do- watching documentaries over them, you wonder how much they knew at the time. It's like the Disneys. How, did they know going into it, like, we are going to make an empire out of this? Right. And did they even know when they died how 
massive and how long lasting the Disney company would yeah. be and how Sheesh. influential on American society and on the world it would be. So this is giving us a little bit of insight into the fact that the Kennedy siblings did have some sort of sense of responsibility and that's the thing. I think that they did so much with their privilege because they were so aware of the rarity of it. There was a clip of Bobby talking in this Bobby for President um, documentary series on Netflix, which is really, really good if you want to go watch it. But an interviewer was asking him, do you think that being so wealthy contributed to your family's success because all of you are so successful? And Bobby kind of responded with, yeah, I mean, I think that not having to worry about money affords you the ability to focus on other things. And it was just like, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, obviously. Yeah. And this is sort of what makes me nervous about today's society and our culture now is that you almost feel bad for your privilege, bad for your skin color. You feel bad because, well, why did I get this when other people didn't? And you don't choose the family that you're born into, whether that be a bad thing or a good thing. And so they don't use what they could, what they were given to help others. Yes. They throw it in the trash. It's just such a sticky situation and a hard line or a hard thing to balance of being like acknowledging, yes, I am privileged and I didn't do anything to get the foundation that I was born into, but I've done X, Y, and Z to get me from, you know, birth till now. Like JFK didn't become president because of the family that he was born into. He became president because of the family he was born into, plus a lot of hard work, plus generations of people pouring into him and his family. But maybe the the morally right thing to do rather than ignore your privilege or throw it away or try to hide it from shame, the morally right thing to do would be to, okay, if you if you do feel like I don't deserve this, well, then use it for good. Use it for other people. Use your cup that's overflowing to fill other people's cup. Don't be like, oh, crap, let me just dump it into the freaking Or just waste. hide just, it. Like, yeah, hide it, waste it, whatever. I feel like, too, with our generation and us all having access to everyone's personal lives and access to commenting on everyone's personal lives, it makes you even more in that like judgmental mindset. It was a conversation that you brought up the other day. It doesn't matter. People are always going to think whatever they want to think. You're not going to be able to convince all these random strangers who don't really know you that you're a good person or that you're doing the right thing or whatever. You just have to decide I'm going to be the best person that I can be and then know that. Yes. And if you allow the people in your inner circle to sort of be that sounding board for you, then that's where you can take constructive criticism and you can kind of be um, called out for things Mm -hmm. and you'll actually listen to it because those people know you in your real life, your thoughts, your motivations, and all of the other people who are just judging you from the sidelines they won't get through that outer armor because you're like, well, you don't know me and I know that I'm a good person and the people in my real life think that I'm a good person. You have to have that solid like armor or that that, just that foundation. That's something that I'm always working on because not even online, like online people don't bother me as much, but just me wondering what other people think about me has been something that I struggle with. I really, really like this quote and I have no idea who it's from or where I heard it, but If you wouldn't take advice from them, don't take the criticism either. Mm. In the first Kennedy family meeting, we talked a lot about Joe and Rose's parenting dynamic and their individual personalities, but I wanted to also talk a little bit more about how they influenced their children and who their children became. I was thinking about it, about how you can really control so much of your children's destiny The parents had such different parenting styles and different personalities in general, and it still is kind of weird to me how they ended up together, but (laughs) uh, the mom was super like militaristic and very perfectionistic and wanted the outside world to see them as one one unit, the Kennedys, and to see them all in matching dresses and all wearing the same. Catholic. Yeah. And- Joe, their dad, was sort of the opposite. Like he wanted the best for his kids, but instead of wanting the best for my kids, as in they get everything that they need or whatever, like the mom, I think, really was worried about providing for them. Yeah. But their dad was worried about them like digging deep and becoming the absolute best humans, citizens, 
Americans that they can be. And his like avenue to them becoming that was to make sure that they had independence and like critical thinking skills. Yes, unique and thought. We're fine with going outside of the box and being different and being weird. And because that's who he was. And Rose raised them to be who she was. Right. Yeah. They were exactly. very much just projecting their what own. was right in their mind. Yeah. Yeah. And for her, it was right to be good Catholic kids. And for him, it was right to be a contributors. Yeah. Contributors and responsible. His heroes were all of those entrepreneurs who not only like gained success for themselves, but who provided something to others, to the world. All of those big Carnegie, Rockefeller, JP, JP Morgan, right. all those. it's like a business or an invention or something. Yeah. It's like access to light or cheaper gas or whatever it was. You were contributing to the world stage rather than just falling in line. He, he wanted change makers mm -hmm. and that's what they became. Yeah. But they also maybe learned from Rose to care for the one next to them. Maybe Joe taught them to go out and push forward, but Rose taught them to like kind of link arms and consider. And we'll talk about that in the next episode as well. And both parents were like yeah, united, you know, be united. And for Joe, that's you'll conquer more. You'll be able to go you'll deeper go further. and go faster and further. And for the mom, it was you'll take care of each other. So I think that Rose's regimentation and strict parenting style combined with Joe's risk-taking, confident aura about him that he passed down to his children is what created this incredible rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> I remember voice texting this on the porch. Oh, great. Like, no. <laughs> That was when we were mad at each other. <laughs> Rocket ship that took all of the children to the highest height. <laughs> um, but then he... <laughs> You're dying. I'm dying. I know. Okay. We're almost done. It's also interesting because they had like nannies and people caring for their, like adults caring for their kids, but that's not who the responsibility of running the personal family matters was. Joe Jr. wasn't packing their lunch bags or cooking dinner. And you'll see later, there were certain things that were just Kennedy territory, family territory. It seems like they delegated out all of the like domestic tasks, but leading the family was the responsibility of the actual family members. I feel like a lot of other rich people, it's like, oh, I was raised by my nanny. In episode one, you talk about how they literally scheduled their life around one parent being around with the kids at all times. Right. You'll definitely see that as a trend as we go further. The oldest, quote unquote, siblings, um, you'll see that they gave them a lot of responsibility of like kind of being a pseudo parent and they would always – Remind them, hey, encourage your sibling in this. Make sure they're doing this. And it's something that continued their whole childhood. And that's a huge contrast in between the Kennedys and the Bouviers. Oh, because wow, yes. The Bouviers' <gasps> parents were always gone. And the Kennedys were like, they Rose literally said, Joe and I decided early on that our kids were going to be our best friends. With Janet and Blackjack, they – Hung out with their, with their kids sometimes, but they had no problem leaving their kids for like months and months at a time. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I just, every time I hear Blackjack, uh, black I'm like, is it Blackjack or Jack Black? And then the second I think Jack, Jack Black, Black, I'm like, like Panda, Rock the Pack! Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> or School of Rock, and like, wah, 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 and then I just <laughs> laugh. Like, oh my he gosh. is so ridiculous. He is ridiculous. Okay, okay. Anyways. So that's interesting as well. And I think that maybe the more positive sibling relationships, you can tell that their parents yeah. pit them against each other less. I just think it's interesting the two different paths that the Bouvier parents took versus the Kennedy parents yeah. and how Jackie and Jack obviously ended up basically with the same, obviously in the same marriage and with the same adulthood, Life, adult so. experience. But yeah. And the two different paths took them there. But with the sibling relationships, you can really tell all of the heartache and turmoil and the insane competition that like stole Lee's entire life versus with Joe and Jack, who had the the same type of competitive relationship. It was a little bit healthier and a little bit less all-encompassing and 
they didn't drown in that relationship of competition as much. It's like because there was only two with Jackie and Lee, you're the only one that's left out. Yeah. You're the you're the one child that is not as loved. And there's only one with when you have lots of siblings, oh, it's like, oh, everyone's different. Everyone has different talents, everyone has different personalities. But it's like, it's you and me. Yeah, either I hate you and you're the issue or poor me, I'm the issue, I'm broken. Or the mom being like, well, I like this quality better, so the other one's bad. Oh, Lee, you're prettier, so Jackie must be ugly. Exactly. Yeah. And my gosh, can we please just chill out on people monitoring other people's weight? <laughs> it's weird, though. Starting at like five years old or or like probably starting at birth, they're weighing these children. Yes, but it's it almost seems like a royal practice. I think that the uh, I was watching something with Princess Di and she had to be weighed by like in front of everyone. It was like Spencer. on Saturday. <laughs> Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually. Um, I, at first, I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> I thought you were just like, <laughs> I just had a random thought that I had to yell. Um, but that is based on yeah, the the, the, the royal family does do regular weighings. So bizarre, but it it's not only their family. It is like Cassie's saying, kind of a elite culture but also kind of the time period that they were in because there are sev- several letters from people that are outside of the Kennedy family that are describing the Kennedy siblings and the Kennedy family members and mention their weight as like a character of them or a trait of them as a person. And at least I had the perception that in like the 2000s, the 90s, we were like hyper fixated on weight and like everybody cares about weight now in the present and like that's a modern thing, but no. Definitely not. I, okay, you know why I thought that? Because m- freaking dad always told us, oh, people back then, like in the, you know, 1600s, 15th century, didn't have enough food to eat. So it was a privilege to be plump. Yes, plump. And you wanted and- to have meat on your bones because that was like, oh, I have a lot of money. I have wealth. I yeah. have enough food to eat until I am full. But yeah, it is weird to look back and see what culture was like around body image and weight. Yikes. <laughs> but the whole rose making them all be weighed in front of each other, to me, would seem like a recipe for absolute disaster. disaster. And I could not handle that. No. In like self-esteem and competition and in just breeding like this constant, I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. Just arguing, fighting. Yeah. But it wasn't like that at all. So I'm still just absolutely so confused about the whole parenting aspect of the Kennedys, but also like how they cultivated such competitive people individually, but But confident people, but such confident people. And they were all really wanting each other to win. Like they all actually wanted the best for each other. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, with the Bouvier sisters, I really do think that Lee wanted to see Jackie fall Yeah, in a sort of way. It's like she, part of her was absolutely happy for her sister, but a good portion of her like really wanted some bad crap to happen to her because she felt like her life was unfair and blah, blah, blah. Well, and I think Jackie didn't really care too much about Lee being successful or finding herself either. Right. And didn't care too much about Lee being sad and left behind. Right. They were like, well, that's your issue. And the Kennedys took on each other's problems. A high tide rises all ships or whatever crud that saying is. So that's an interesting dynamic to me. Because in my doing research and finding photographs of the siblings as adults, there are so many photos of the siblings together waiting for some sort of results yep. or career things happening. And some of the siblings are in the background and the other siblings are a part of the actual campaign. They were all so in it with each other and a success for one was a success for all. So I think that that's really cool about their sibling set is that they really were like all for one and one for all. And um, Uh, it just blows the Bouvier episode dynamic out of the water because it makes it look even worse. That's what I'm saying. It makes it look so much worse because you want to have like, okay, some understanding and grace. You want to, yes. Put yourself in their shoes. But then- you think back to when Jackie didn't show up to Lee's play that she had practiced and like 
She had been wanting to find her thing for decades. She wanted her own identity. She didn't even want the theater to bill her as Lee Radziwill because she didn't want her husband's notoriety. She didn't want them to like advertise the fact that she was Jackie Kennedy's sister because she wanted her own limelight. And her sister knew that. And she did not come to her perform, not a single performance. Although Lee had major jealousy issues, she did not skip out on Jackie's important moments. She showed yeah, up. Yeah, she definitely showed up. Even for Jack's important yeah. moments, not even Jackie's. I'm telling you, Jackie Kennedy smells a little fishy. The more I think about her, like even in hindsight, after our episodes were recorded, I'm like, what the heck? Especially since she was around the Kennedys and all of their siblings. Like, yes. And she invite was, Lee in more. Yes. And she was smarter than that. Like, come on. They did have very different childhoods. And yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. The whole parent, their parents basically abandoned them. Like both of them kind mm-hmm. of abandoned them. And so I think that that was like put them automatically in survival mode. Scarcity mindset. Yes, There's not every enough man attention himself, to go around. It's either me or you survives, gets out of this. Yeah. Either me or you is loved. Either me or you is the good kid. There just wasn't an even playing field, field ever. Another thing that jumped out at me in the second episode was the fact that Jack didn't hear or really even know about the Great Depression until he went to Harvard. That shocks me for a couple of reasons. Living through the pandemic, I can't imagine anyone like younger than eight years old not knowing what's happening as it's happening. Yeah, because that's like the biggest thing that's happened in our lifetime. And the Great Depression was definitely the biggest thing that had happened so far in JFK's life. Yes. And because he wasn't like five when it happened, you would think that he would be hearing like adults around him talk about it, hear it on the radio. A bit of clarification on that. Jack was born in 1917, so he would have been like a preteen teenager as the Depression is happening. And because the Kennedys treated their kids like many adults, right? you would think that That's they would so be discussing these types of things. And because the Kennedys are obviously into politics and were, their grandpa was mayor of Boston and they were in that scene. It's not like they were super ignorant of, yeah, current events and policy the public state. and, yeah, economy and stuff like that. Which makes me think, like, then it had to been purposeful by their parents to not tell them about it. I, I don't know where I want to take this because I have two different thoughts. It makes me personally think through my own motives and just, like, the current culture that we are in right now and the the social norm or the social standard of, like, you need to be as informed and as woke oh as possible gosh, to yeah. be a good person. And if you don't know about X, Y, and Z policy or just like hot topics sort of in in politics well, or in what's government just- right now, to be a good person, to be an advocate. And the Kennedys just kind of like made the best decision that they could whenever a question or like a moral dilemma came to them and they just picked what they needed to pick and moved on with their life instead of being like, I need to know a little bit about everything. Well, I yeah, I think that people nowadays have the mentality that you need to know about every single person's pain. And like if you don't know what other people – what every single other person is going through with every single other topic, then it's like horrible. But like to what end? Yes, to what end? And what is that even accomplishing really? Because – Going through the pandemic and all of the social and political and economic unrest that we've had in the past three years, it kind of like wore me down. And I was one of those people who would read the news every single morning on like CNN, on um, BBC, on Fox, like literally anything that I could get my hands on just to hear everyone's different perspectives and what everyone else thought was. And I'm like in my 20s, so I'm like trying to figure out I'm in college trying to figure out what is right, what is mm-hmm. correct. And I want to be educated and I want to know everyone else's pain and I want to know what I need to fight for and who I need to fight for. But then it's like all I'm doing all day, every day is Is just consuming consuming and being like and feeling beat down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like an advocate at my core. Like that's my personality. I'm an Enneagram one and I want to like fight for people and justice is like super important to me. But I was like just reading the news and listening to other people and hearing about all of these different rallies and everything so much so that I could not, I was like paralyzed. Yeah. I think that the Kennedys are practical people to the point of 
they did carry a responsibility and they did go out and help people and they did pull their weight and they did they pulled more than their weight they yeah they they, did accomplished more socially morally politically than than anyone i know they left they left a like bigger not, legacy. not that we know personally anyone we know yes period <laughs> they left more like of a legacy Martin Luther, yeah. yes exactly or winston churchill or something like that they left such a legacy and like absolutely pierced through insane things that were like systemic things huge things yeah what what they did was they were purposeful, strategic, and practical, and they did not listen to what other people told them that they should do. They did what they knew mattered. And so if they their kids didn't need to freaking know about this, it wasn't that they were just like, right. we're not going to participate. What was well, what was JFK going to do about the Great exactly. Depression as like a 13-year-old? Really? He, he wasn't. Actually, what was yeah. he going to do? And I still don't know. What I tell my 11-year-old, 12-year-old about the pandemic as it's happening, I feel like I would. But that's also I'm living in an age where we're inundated with freaking social yeah. media and there's absolutely no way that they're going to get by without knowing about it because their teacher is going to tell them about it. The kids at school are going to tell them about it, but also like they're going to see it on their phones and on TV. And the other thing is we'll talk more about this as we go on in episodes, but um, you also have to remember how many children Rose had, how many different issues her children had. Maybe that was the moment in life when they didn't have the capacity and that just wasn't the priority to talk about that because that was a priority a lot of the times, discussing events and and moral issues like this. But you also have to give people grace and just know, we don't always know the whole story. Yes, what all is happening and is someone like fighting for their life at this point or – are huge, chaotic, traumatic events happening in a family at this point. And maybe what is all up in their face is not what is happening on the world stage. It's what's happening in my home. And that's the thing. Maybe that wasn't the Kennedy's biggest issue right then. And that isn't inherently evil. But a takeaway that I am like taking from the Kennedys, and I obviously haven't even heard the entire Kennedy sibling story yet, but one of the biggest things I'm taking away is to – Pick what hill you're going to die on and then you can add like little side advocacy moments in there, but you cannot die on every hill. We are human and in a perfect world, if we were all perfect creatures, yes, that would be ideal. We could give a crap about every single thing that does matter and that does need to see the light of day and issues that do need to be changed, but I cannot be a social justice warrior for every. Thing that needs change and whatever. So anyways, I think it's super encouraging. And at the end of the Kennedy sibling story, we will hear about like all the different areas and all the different fronts that the Kennedy siblings helped change. But the whole JFK not knowing anything about the Great Depression until he gets to Harvard in college blows my mind. And it makes me think of the book Educated, which if you're into reading at all, you've probably read this. But the girl in it, and for completely different reasons than JFK, she grew up in a bubble. Grew up in a bubble, but in a more impoverished, um, very strictly religious Mormon household, basically on a on a mountain, on and, a compound. Yeah, kind of like on a compound with his with her family and with her siblings. If you love sibling stories, read the book Educated. It's super good. Um, but she did not know about the Holocaust until she went to college. I think her professor said something about the Holocaust and she raised her hand and asked, what's the Holocaust? And everyone thought she was like making fun of it. And she had literally never heard the word before. So anyways, I just think that's really interesting. And also a sibling story shout out because she had like eight brothers and sisters as well. And that is educated by Tara Westover if you want to check it out. So a quote that gives massive insight into Jack's personality to me, which didn't fit in the picture I had of him in my head before doing all of this research, was the one where he asked his mom, which room do I have this time, mother? Every time he came home for the summers from boarding school. Yeah, you don't see them as vagabond children. You see them as like little kings and queens with their own. Yes, super rich. Yeah. Had a massive house. Um, were all at boarding school and then would come home to their like perfectly furnished bedrooms that all had like, I don't know, sailing photos on the walls and their awards from school and sports and all of that kind of stuff. Just like a typical rich kid's bedroom. 
but it doesn't sound like it was like that at all. And I don't even know where they would put those like personal memorabilia type things. I think that that has to have a huge effect on you forming your identity, especially as a kid having your own room. That's something that is a very middle class thing. Like there are kids who have the couch and that's where they keep their clothes underneath the couch. I guess on the other end of the spectrum is, yeah, you're so, you have so much that nothing is really yours and it's all just, it doesn't matter. Things don't matter because there's never been a lack of. And so you don't need your own stuff. You don't have a scarcity mindset whatsoever. Right. You just buy another one if you can't find it. But I think the vast majority is this middle ground where it's like, that's my room. Even if you share it with your siblings, it's Mm -hmm. still like your domain. You still have your nightstand with your drawers and your whatever. And I, I want, I don't know what the effect is, but I want to know, because I feel like that has to be a huge factor in your shaping of who you are, who you, who are you in your mind? Do you belong to yourself or do you belong to the common cause? The U S is a very independent, individual minded society. Do you see the world in an individualist mind versus a collectivist mindset? And what does that mean for you and who you are and what you're going to do with your life? And I feel like the Kennedys definitely viewed themselves in some way, shape, or form in this collectivist. My specific life doesn't really matter. It's what I can do. You see the end product of them doing all these things for society, which we haven't even gotten into yet. But then you go back to their childhood and you kind of see those seeds of why they think like that. The building blocks that got them to where they ended up. So yeah, it brings up that idea of what does it do for a kid's identity and how it shapes their view of the world and them as a person in the world. But then it also, which Cassie originally brought this up to me, it also kind of brings up the idea that Jack didn't really, or any of the Kennedy siblings really, but especially Jack, didn't feel as though he or all of the siblings that they didn't have to abide by the rules governing society that they could do whatever they wanted to do. And you, you hear that again in the whole like gas station story (laughs) Yeah, that they just took the responsibility or they took the initiative. They did what they wanted and they didn't make themselves or their ideas fit inside of a box. And I think that Joe really had a hand in teaching them that the dad, if it doesn't, yeah, Joe, the dad, Joe senior, if, it doesn't exist, invent it. If it do, if it hasn't been created, well, let's create it. Let's build a group. Let's do this. Joe Sr. didn't do things just because that's what you were supposed to do. He questioned everything. And he taught his kids to have individual thought and to question everyone, including him. Yeah. And you'll see how that kind of bites him in the butt in the future. But, <laughs> but there I was no, like that. yeah, there was no end all be all authority who should not be questioned other than God. Mm-hmm. That's definitely true. And I'm excited for you guys to hear the episodes that lead up to Jack becoming president because that whole idea of there is no end all be all except for God kind of played into, hey, I could be president. And then it played into why some people didn't want Jack to be president. Join us here next week to hear all about Rosemary, the hidden Kennedy daughter, and the start of the infamous Kennedy curse. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business.